So my uh, clarificatory point would be, does the government actually track how many SMEs take advantage of these schemes and grow and stop becoming SMEs and actually become global companies? Is there a number to that? Are, are those results being tracked? And if, in fact, those results are tracked and those results are not good, then would that not suggest that there is a role for uh, the government to take a more active stance in uh, grooming these companies? Uh, the second point is relating to funding. I'd like to uh, ask the minister whether there is any data from SMEs through surveys and other means to suggest that the funding needs that they have are being sufficiently met by existing schemes and by other funding providers within the funding ecosystem. Because I certainly do hear feedback that the funding needs are not, not fully met. Uh, and would the minister not acknowledge that if so, would there not be a more, uh, would there not be a role for the government to actually be more interventionist to provide funding at higher levels of caps for those SMEs which have self-selected themselves by demonstrating a track record of results as opposed to SMEs who remain SMEs for decades. And my third point is really on the issue of long-termism which I, which I raised. I mean, uh, people will not become entrepreneurs if they feel that structurally and culturally the environment is not uh, conducive to, to SMEs. There are many schemes that have been in the past, but some of these schemes have limits. Some of these schemes will be phased out in the future in the way that the PIC is being tapered down. For example, some of the current schemes will be phased out. That may affect the willingness of people to become entrepreneurs because there may be many schemes on the table now, but in 10 years, those schemes may be phased out. And it's in that context that I raised land costs, uh, funding, and the overall culture. So what would be the government's strategy to address that fundamental structural impediment to entrepreneurship? Thank you. Let me speak. I uh, thank the member for his uh, range of questions. Maybe I start with the, if I may take the last one first. If somebody becomes an entrepreneur because he wants government schemes and support, then that's probably the wrong starting point, if I may respectfully suggest. I think the starting point for any entrepreneur is really in deciding that he or she has a strong value proposition, a passion to grow something, and then they go out there and make it happen. And indeed, we have many outstanding examples of entrepreneurs who have done exactly that. And along the way, yes, they benefit from certain government support schemes. But I think we shouldn't put the cart before the horse. The government cannot mandate entrepreneurship. The government cannot even, for we can't force entrepreneurship. It has to come from the individuals who have the motivation to make it happen. Our schemes can enable, but they can never be a foolproof support system for this. I think the other points that the member has made, what are the results of the various schemes? We track them. Uh, if there's one thing that we do rigorously is we track the take-up rates, the outcomes, there are KPIs associated with any uh, program that we introduce. But I would say that you know the member raised the point, how many take up the scheme? Uh, how many uh, globally competitive companies were created, etc. So let me take a couple of those points. How many take up the scheme? We can initiate the schemes. We can create channels that make it easier for companies to find out about the schemes. We have got SME centers. Uh, Mr. Thomas Chua will tell you that in the SCCCI has got one of the most active SME centers in Singapore. And we find a plethora of ways of communicating. But at the end of the day, the take-up rate rests with the individual companies. Minimally, you have to make the effort to find out what it is that's available, what are my needs, and where's the match, and how do I get it for? And you don't need to do it alone, because we have the SME centers, and we have even our economic agencies are prepared to work with them. As for the rate at which we get globally competitive companies, so if I may draw members' uh, attention, uh, in the ESC report, uh, there was a goal to have 1,000 uh, companies that cross the 100 million turnover mark by the end of this decade. Uh, and that was an important directional goal because it's to set a sense of the scale of ambition that we have. And if, it's something that uh, we continue to monitor. And I would say that on balance, we are on track to getting there. Now, whether we will actually hit 1,000 or not, I think remains to be seen because there are many factors beyond our control. But the general directional push is very clear, and we've in fact seen that grow. But let me make one other point. Ultimately, whether we end up having a local enterprise that becomes a 
a global champion, again, cannot rest just with the government, you know, because we have many instances where companies grow and when they reach a certain stage, they get a very tempting offer from a, either a fund or some larger company and they sell out. Then do we then say that our effort has failed? Or do we say then that, well, this is the realities of the market and we have to live with it because there will be some of this development. In Israel, for example, they are known as a startup nation because they generate a tremendous amount of knowledge which generates in many startup companies. But ask yourself the question, in Israel, is it a scale-up nation? And how far do they go in scaling up? And in fact, I think the Israelis themselves will tell you that this is one of their main focal points. How do we get our companies to scale up? Because that creates the next level of depth in the economy and the capabilities that we see. As for funding needs, um, my general point would be this. I have never been in a conversation where uh, they t uh, companies or enterprises tell me that funding is completely met because the need is always there. It's different kinds of needs. You have a spectrum of uh, uh, funding providers in the market, whether it is government schemes and grants, obviously, but then government-supported schemes, whether it is venture capital, angel funding, and so on. And it goes right through to private equity and then larger scale. And of course, you can then tap public markets. And now we've got a lot more crowdfunding platforms. So actually, there's a lot of mechanisms available. But there will always be mismatches or gaps because the, the needs and the market situation keeps changing. And that is why I think ultimately what is required is not so much about government intervening in order to, by providing the, the lending solution per se, but is to keep track of the situation, understanding is this a regulatory impediment? Is this a market failure? Is this because we are not getting the relevant players around the table to understand the issues and then deal with it? So a case in point is what we are doing with the infrastructure financing I elaborated on. Because for the smaller businesses in the infrastructure space, this was a real issue. Big banks and other funds, when, it, when they typically do financing for uh, infrastructure projects, they do uh, project financing, but they need big ticket numbers. They need a billion dollar project in the book because it doesn't justify the level of work, right? So the easy way out when you're dealing with smaller companies or the one way to mitigate the risk is to say, I need personal guarantees and corporate guarantees, which immediately shackles the company in terms of how far it can go. So we've tried to come in with this scheme. We have to see, this is after consultation with all the key players, the banks, the, uh, the industry companies, and so on. And we'll have to see whether it takes off, how successful it will be, and whether there's a need to recalibrate.